Uh, I'm Shankar Chebrolu and I work for Cisco Systems. I'm here today to share the work we have done um, in the OWASP Top 10 Cloud Security Project. Um, it's, it's a collaborative effort uh, primarily among three of us. All of us work for Cisco, um, you know, all our IT architects working in different uh, departments within Cisco supporting different function group. Uh, Vinay Bansal um, is, is full-time security architect and myself, uh, myself and Pankaj uh, are IT architects supporting you know, different function groups. But security is not our primary responsibilities, uh, at least not in the last you know, few years, but we used to be primary on security before. Um, that, so today's agenda is, I'll spend a little bit of time on uh, about the project to you know how it started and what is the motivation and the approach we took to come up with a list of uh, top 10 uh, security risks uh, which is on the similar lines of top 10 uh, vulnerabilities of, of web application which is prob probably the most one of the popular uh, OWASP projects and uh, why is that important for us what, what makes us to uh, to think about say, uh, cloud computing as an important to spend time to analyze the risks and, and the you know, probably uh, risk mitigations uh, therein. And some, the core of the presentation is around the fourth and fifth bullets, uh, but I'm not going to go through the first, all the risks and then the risk mitigations. I'm going to go the risk and mitigation, risk and mitigation kind of a thing. And I'm pretty sure I'll have some time um, towards the end, uh, maybe five, 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, that's with that, so as I said, um, you know, uh, we started as, as a special interest, interest group on the cloud computing, um, and we, have, we worked in our uh, previous jobs uh, to review the security of application service providers. Now you could call them as cloud uh, providers, you know, depending on whether it's a service, software service providers or, or platform as a service. Based on that now, uh, experience uh, and based on uh, the interest that we want to understand what are the new risks that the cloud providers come in with the cloud technologies and the adoption. Uh, we want to develop and maintain the cloud, uh, top 10. Um, initially with, within Cisco and then we thought that okay, we, we could use this as a um, reusable uh, <coughs> document uh, in the industry and then we approached Vovasp uh, who readily gave us uh, the access to create a project and work on that. Um, <coughs> and not only just to come up with a list of risks that we think that there are, but also potential gui uh, provide guidelines for potential mitigations uh, for those risks. Yeah. So the approach we took is um, we read a lot of uh, you know research articles on cloud security and market research and academic research. Um, you know we, we referred on IIS Square articles, NIST um, cloud security alliance guidelines, and all. All, all the relevant information that we could think of and we applied our own industry knowledge around uh, reviewing application service providers um, to come up with this list. And also to prioritize and order the risks R1 to R10, we, we, we uh, used some of the elements like what is the most damaging uh, thing that could happen or, or what is the most um, frequent in incidents that we heard in the industry. I'm not going to go through the incidences of the cloud providers. Uh, in this in this session, even though it does, most of them are public information, probably there's only one slide which which refers to some incidences. Uh, so why is it important? The according to Gartner, uh, cloud computing is the top uh, strategic technology uh, in 2010. I think it's still in 2011 and, and beyond. As per their um, projections, last year they said that. Global expenditure on adoption of cloud-based solutions and services may top $150 billion. Uh, actually, last month I was reading um, the report from CIO on CIO.gov, um, which is public uh, public record or uh, report. They are projecting in the next few years, uh, I think in the next four years, they are going to spend $20 billion out of $80 billion IT, federal IT government budget on the adoption of cloud computing services and solutions. That's about 25% of the total budget. And they gave a, a, a number like they're planning to close 800 federal government owned data centers by migrating their applications and platforms or infrastructure, whatever it is, uh, towards uh, the cloud providers in, by 2015. It, it's, it's just published in July 
2011. So, um, according to IDC, which is a market uh, research firm, um, they they did some survey, and they usually do such surveys every quarter, uh, depending on what is the hottest topic at that time. And they came up with a list of why, why people are running towards uh, cloud adoption of cloud computing. Number one is cost, and also uh, pay-as-you-go model. You could argue that over a very long time, pay-as-you-go on a monthly or quarterly basis may be more expensive than investing in a, in a traditional data center. But because of the, um, the current situation where there's a lot of macroeconomic conditions and a lot of uncertainty in the market, uh, the IT enterprises, large, small, medium companies are focusing on go as, uh, pay as you go model um, to begin with. And, and, the, and the promises of the cloud providers like uh, faster provisioning and up in, uh, time to capabilities being very low, you know, that, that's that's according to the risk in this market research and there are many other uh, research reports that, that, that they uh, show that there are many benefits and these probably are one of them. Um, it is a slide which I am using from my own PhD dissertation which I did last year um, which is very simplified um, than what it used to look like. Uh, I wanted to find the correlation with, among the cloud adoption, strategic alignment and uh, IT effectiveness. So not to discuss about strategic alignment in this session for our agenda here, uh, I collected data from uh, the CIOs in the United States uh, which belong to different IT organizations of different type, size, for-profit, non-profit, government organizations, so and so forth. And the data shows that, yes, in the adoption of the cloud computing product services solutions in their IT respective IT organizations impact uh, positively correlated and positively impact their IT effectiveness. There are so many elements within the, what it means by cloud adoption, but it's for simplicity reasons I simplify it. Um, so this is another slide from uh, the re results from IDC again. Well, there are so many benefits. So why are we talking about cloud risks here? So the number one reason why of, of the number one challenge or reason why people are, are not even uh, considering service for some organizations is, is the security and the next one is availability. You know, anybody else, CIA are the three pillars of uh, confidentiality, integrity and availability are the three um, pillars of security. So the, the top two reasons in this, in this picture and for, us, for our practical purpose is number one security. So that's the core, that, that's a good segue to get into why we are talk, why we are trying to understand what are the cloud risks and how we can possibly mitigate it. The, the idea is not to discourage, right? Um, and I don't think anybody will listen to, uh, uh, even if you discourage, but because the, the promises of the low cost and faster time to capability, uh, faster provisioning will, is definitely driving uh, enterprises, small, medium, uh, large companies to adopt cloud, com uh, cloud technologies. But the idea here is, okay, you can, you can adopt, but make sure that you, you think up about your security from these lines. Not all the risks, risks apply to all the enterprises. Not all the risks apply to all the applications. It depends on the data sensitivity and, and various other, other um, attributes of, of the cloud. So j before I start uh, uh, R1 to R10, so I just want to um, refer to the cloud main actors diagram that, that is published by Nest. Cloud provider and cloud consumer are, are you know, by the terms are self-explanatory. A provider is someone who provides the services and sells them, um, like you know, WebEx, which is a software service provider, Google, both SaaS and PaaS, um, Amazon, probably infrastructure service provider, service, Terama, same, Salesforce.com is SaaS provider. And a consumer is one who, it could be an end user or it could be a, or a very large organization. For example, Cisco, we use, 200 application service providers, probably five or six infrastructure as service providers. As far as I know, none um, platform as a service provider. So it depends on the end company to company, and uh, it could be an end user too, uh, who could be using just a Gmail service, which is email on the cloud. Um, the cloud broker and cloud auditor probably are relatively new terms. Uh, cloud broker is an entity which manages the relationship between the consumer and the provider, uh, and also, it adds its own uh, features like 
manage the use, delivery, and performance, and even even the security. They promise uh, enhance the security of the of the cloud services by, for example, use uh, IPsec uh, connections between the provider and the consumer. Even the provider doesn't provide that uh, right off the bat. But Amazon, for example. They, they are providers and also provide a cloud broker to, to deploy in your data center to open a uh, VPN tunnel between your uh, the consumer and the provider. But, but you could use those cloud brokers. There are like independent cloud broker companies. Just like uh, 10 years back, there used to be ORBs, uh, object request brokers, who, which you, whose purpose is to uh, broker an object server and the object client. Um, so, so cloud broker is, there are many companies uh, who are working on that. The cloud auditor is, um, is an independent organization who probably does, mostly it's relevant to the sec independent security assessments of the providers, uh, but they need to collect information from cloud consumers, cloud brokers, not just security, right? They may be assessing the performance of the cloud services and so on and so, on and so forth. So for, just for the completion, um, completeness of the presentation, right? So I just want to touch upon some of the service models and deployment models that NIST recognizes. You probably might have heard about a fourth service model, which is data center as a service, which is basically dividing that infrastructure as a service model into further into two different um, models where different uh, uh, players can operate as, um, you know, some. Uh, data center service, but that's still not recognized in the industry. So we'll just uh, focus on what, what is already published by NIST. Um, so again, I think I uh, gave examples of SaaS. Salesforce.com probably is one of the uh, famous uh, SaaS providers for enterprises, Gmail, and so on and so forth. Platform as service, um, according to me, is the least mature model of these three. SaaS, probably the most mature model. Uh, infrastructure service, probably in the middle. Um, there are not many players in infrastructure service, um, as far as I know, Terimark, Savvis, uh, Amazon, GoGrid, and, and few others. Um, SaaS, the reason why there are so many players is, when 11 years back, or you know, I used to work for a, a ASP, Application Service Provider, which is expensable.com. So now it's all of a sudden it's a um, SaaS provider. Right? So, um, Cisco itself, I, I don't know whether I mentioned or not, we use 200 application service providers. Uh, most of them are SaaS providers, so for HR, for supply chain, for finance, so on and so forth. Uh, as a uh, platform, as a service model, the main key players are Microsoft Azure platform, Google Apps, uh, Google Docs is again SaaS, but Google, uh, Google Apps. Uh, Cisco has got its own couple of them, but I don't know how famous are they are, like EOS Enterprise, Operating System, and WebEx Connect. And infrastructure. We use <coughs> Amazon, we use Savvis, we use Terramark, so on and so forth. So public clouds, all the, all the names that I mentioned are all public clouds. And a lot of the large enterprises, uh, they uh, probably are working on their, pro uh, their own private clouds. A data, an internal data center is not necessarily a private a cloud because you know, it needs to have these five essential characteristics displayed down according to NIST, you know, elasticity, measured service, pay as you go, that, that kind of a, that kind of characteristics, right? But you know, for, for some discussions, people may use internal cloud and internal data center interchangeably. Um, but if if a if a host or a service cannot be provisioned, um, you know, in few minutes, that that is not really uh, implementing the the required cloud technologies and virtualization, so on and so forth. Most of the large organizations have their own private clouds or internal data centers, and then they probably use some of the public cloud providers. That makes it hybrid. That's, that's a hybrid cloud model. And some, uh, some large enterprises and medium, uh, medium, enterprises, uh, medium companies may be using a data center just accessible within themselves. That's a community cloud. So it's not really, it's on premise of one particular um, entity or company, but they all share, but still a private to only those, three, those few, and, the, and that makes, uh, it's a community cloud. They're not public clouds. So this, this is the list of, uh, you know, the top 10 risks that we identified. Um, we made sure the number is 10, um, you know, uh, because incidents analysis and forensics 
was identified as two different initially and then we clubbed it because it's the same kind of issues. Um, so the objective is to keep it uh, consistent with the number of top 10 vulnerabilities that are, men in, you know, that are maintained on OWASP. So we, we, we identified that, that accountability and the data risk is the number one issue uh, for cloud. And again, it depends on the data sensitivity, uh, but the damage, if, if some damage happens, and it, this is, could be the biggest issue. So who is accountable for, for the security of your application, your data and networks, uh, so on and so forth? Because we, with the three service models, each of the tech stack that, that are shown there, application to storage, you know, are, are owned and operated or controlled by different players. So in the infrastructure service provider model, which is Amazon, EC2, um, you know, service and so on and so forth, the cloud provider has a control and provides computing, network and storage components in the tech stack. The cloud consumer, whether, whether it's a you know, small or medium or large com enterprise, needs to inst uh, manage their own web, app web servers, app servers, database servers, and the application on top of it, the platform and the application on top of it. So who is account so we, the, the, the point here is that we need to ensure that cloud provider and consumer understand the accountability to secure those, those levels that they provide or they operate or they control. Um, and that, that is true with the other two levels also in the past. Be, whoever has control on, on a particular ta tech stack level, right? they must be made sure they, they are accountable and it is um, written in blue, uh, black and blue to make sure that you can always refer back to the contract in SLA, uh, <coughs> SLAs later on if there is an issue. The, the, the complexity comes in when a SaaS provider uses a PaaS model to host their application. Just for an example, right, let's say Salesforce.com, which is a SaaS provider, uses Microsoft platform uh, uh, in, a, in a PaaS model and deploy their applications. But as far as I know, Salesforce.com has their own internal uh, their own data centers where they host their application, they they're, they own all the, the whole tech stack and they uh, provide the application as a service. But if a SaaS provider uses PaaS provider who then uses a different IS in, uh, provider, and now, at, now all of a sudden we have at least four players uh, who in, in that application who needs to understand, okay, now who, who controls what, who is accountable for the security of the application and the data within it. So again, it depends on how sensitive the data. If the data is all public data, uh, so then it probably it's not a big deal. But if the data is uh, something related to um, you know patient records, if if a if a medical application um, is hosted in, in the cloud, you know, a, a financial application which are subject to SOX regulations or a, you know medical records subject to HIPAA regulations, or if an um, application which hosts European zone uh, citizens' data. Uh, which are subject to strict privacy laws. And these, they, the, these cloud providers, they, they have global data centers all, all over the globe and they are in different geographical locations. And, and for the performance reasons, they are, the users are routed to the nearest data centers uh, to meet the performance SLAs. And now all of a sudden, just think about the complexity. If you have four providers and data is distributed all across the globe and the sensitivity of data is high, then there's, um, we need to really think about it. Uh, whether it does, does it even make sense to move that such, such kind of an application and data uh, to cloud. So again, the mitigations, as I said, it's, it's well-established RACI model. Um, it's all needs to be written down and make sure it's, it's in the SLS contract that who is accountable to the, sec to the security of uh, which application. But at the end of the day, it's the cloud consumer is the, is the main, uh, is responsible, responsible for the, let's say, patient's data, right? Uh, if in United Healthcare or some, uh, healthcare um, insurance companies host their application in the cloud. Then, in, in the in the complex model that I mentioned, um, is the ultimate responsible for the for the patient. But needs to uh, United Healthcare needs to understand who is accountable for the security and who is doing what.
and and especially if you have multi, in a multi tenant model where you, you data where the infrastructure or platform or the application hosts data belong to multiple consumers multiple customers so obviously it just increases the risk and the second risk is um, user identities um, proliferation of user identities let's uh, in the previous example where i said our cisco uses 200 serv uh, serv software service providers and the let's say a cisco employee uses even 10 of those uh, applications hosted at different at 10 different service providers so if and each vendor whether it is a inbuilt uh, application that you deploy in your web data center or on the cloud they will have their own authentication and authorization mechanism to make the application complete so if each of those providers create a account or identity for each of the employees of uh, the consumer or, or the users of the consumer um, and, and store it their own user store you know rather cell dapper database then you basically uh, the, uh, can think of the user ex not only the user experience of the of the users using these applications without having a single center and especially when you're moving back between the applications you know finance to HR and HR to some other um, applications um, you you end up uh, not only user experience issues but uh, you would think what happens to the life cycle management of those user IDs if a employee of let's say Cisco leaves the company and joins a competitor right pre in a, in a, in a traditional data uh, um, data center model the you employee records are terminated right away the credentials are destroyed you know assuming there's an automated process HR process in especially in large companies but because these identities are available in the cloud, so the, you, the employee who left just left this company and joins the competitor company can still access those identities um, if, if assuming there are no appropriate controls um, and access, you know, whatever depends on the data sensitivity again, is it the sales promotions or pricing models which, which they can I mean, use, uh, you know, as the time goes. So m probably most of the people are already using this um, so that the solution the mitigation is to use identity federation so I'm sure large companies are already using uh, SAML based integrate uh, federation uh, federated ident uh, identity federation uh, you know ping ident is one vendor and there are other other vendors like sitemen and so on and so forth uh, Oracle uh, who provide um, identity federation in the sense that there are several ways of implementing that but the, the recommended model is not to replicate the user identities across these providers. So just to keep the, the, the enterprise that is shown in the, in the middle, right, in the identifier, they should have the user ID and password uh, credentials in, within their uh, control. And the, all the providers need to come to pass the tokens back and forth to authenticate the user. The advantage is that the moment the employee leaves, you can control at one place. And same user ID password for all the applications, and of course with the proper implementation, you, you, the users enjoy single sign-on um, across the, all the applications. And apart from identity federation, right? So there is another called OpenAuth, um, which provides backend integrations. Um, so you might have seen on Google and Facebook where you can log into one application, and the other will recognize that. So there are some OAuth integrations that are uh, already uh, implemented across some matured um, cloud providers. And uh, again, automated user lifecycle. I mean, if, if you cannot force the cloud providers to come to your user store for authentication, you need to at least implement a mechanism to automate the user termination or lifecycle management of the user identities uh, you know, in place to make sure that the, the user's access is terminated right away. There are some cloud part where you cannot enforce it. Um, for obvious, I mean, there are some technical reasons also, and the business models work that way. The third one is uh, regulatory compliance. Um, the, but the point here is, is the complexity in to demonstrate that your applications are compliant to the regulatory laws, like Fox, uh, SOX or HIPAA. Um, when when SOX first came around, I think this. We spent like $20 million to implement the controls across the various levels in the organization, the business users level, IT admins level, 
um, IT developers level, there's so many, right? So now if you application that is subject to finance, uh, regulatory compliance with the HIPAA or SOX, you know, you, you're deploying in the cloud. So how do you ensure that those same kind of controls that you implemented in your, in your internal uh, company or enterprise are, are also implemented there? So it's just the complexity in demonstrating. You need to still prove it to whoever it is who is assessing your, your applications and data to, to get your SOC certification or HIPAA certification. And again, European Union laws are very strict on the use of privacy data. Um, and if, uh, if the user, uh, you, you use citizen data is uh, hosted in data centers other than Europe, and they, they don't really understand uh, the, the data centers operated in those geographical locations are not um, implementing those similar kind of laws, then the complexity comes um, to demonstrate that. So the mitigations again is uh, apply risk management framework case by case basis. Um, it may not, it may or may not make sense to move a SOX or a HIPAA application into the cloud, public cloud. Um, and come up with a predefined RACI model. Again, some of these mitigations may um, fix multiple risks uh, or at least reduce, manage multiple risks. Define uh, data protection requirements and SLS. Let's say if there is a SOX, then, then you need to implement uh, separation of duties and so on and so forth. So the fourth one is business continuity uh, and resilience. If an application is uh, business critical and revenue impacting, and if, uh, if, you, if the cloud consumer migrates the application into the cloud, right? Uh, then what are the uh, implications if, if the data center of the cloud provider um, are impacted by either a terrorist activity or man-made or natural disasters, right? Um, so if, 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 the, if the data center is on the belt line of an, an, an earthquake prone zone or hurricane or whatever, um, and if the application that you just deployed or migrate to cloud is, is revenue impacting or, or, or in a business critical. So we need to make sure that the application can be brought up either manually or automated within the, within the SLA requirements. So it, and what and some applications ordering systems let's say if they are down for one hour it may result in millions of dollars of loss um, so who is paying for that and all who is penalized for those such such kind of um, risks um, and make sure that the data centers of the cloud providers are built as per the industry standards and they are in active active mode if, if one data center is, is down, the other is still running um, and, and be online immediately or automated or at least in a manually bring online but, but within that key SLA uh, time, timelines. The next risk is uh, the secondary usage of data. Okay. So it, you might have noticed that if you send an, app, uh, a user, an email on, G, G, on using Gmail to someone about your trip, so next time you log into Gmail, you'll get all the advertisements related to that, that information. So someone is, obviously Gmail is data mining that information and from their perspective, they're providing a, uh, uh, some features or help, trying to help their users um, about your trip. But is all data treated like that? You know, sometimes, okay, finding the restaurants or some information related to your trip or travel is good, but if it's a patient information, right? So um, do, do, do users uh, like the fact that, okay, now we are getting advertisements related to your, you know, the, the health defects of, of the patient, um, the life in insurance policies related to that information and all that. So, so um, the, the point here is, who is in control of your private data, the cloud, of the cloud consumer? Are there policies to protect the, the privacy of the cloud consumer? So now, are, are the cloud provider who have access, physical access to the data in their data centers, can they sell it to the third parties who could then uh, market that information or use it for business, uh, for their own business? But, but the problem is, how does it impact your privacy? And what do, how does it impact uh, European Union data? And if the data is across the jurisdiction, 
uh, jurisdictional borders. You cannot, you cannot even, um, you know, do, uh, do anything about it. Sometimes the data is stored somewhere else, other than, uh, outside the U.S. jurisdiction, for example. Uh, again, the mitigation is we need uh, the cloud consumers need to make sure they work with the cloud providers to come up with a policy um, how the data is used that they, the data is, should not be used um, in in the ways that it could impact the cloud consumer. Uh, data is encrypted, um, de-identification of personal information, and so on and so forth. Uh, and also, the main thing is the consent whether you, whether the user wants to opt in for those kind of data mining or secondary usage of the data, or they, could they opt out of those those kind of uh, secondary usage. The next one is uh, the service and data integration. This is one of the models that we are working uh, in, at, at, at um, Cisco, where the users right, use cloud brokers to access multiple cloud providers. And more and more applications that move out, out of their internal cloud or internal data center to the public cloud, the more and more requirements come back uh, from the same business units to connect back into the enterprise data stores. So you you got you migrate the application, but you cannot really. I mean, sometimes you may. In, in case of federal government, they are saying that they are going, going to close down the data centers. Uh, some 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 of them, but in a typical organization, you probably still in a hybrid cloud model, you still will host some of the application in the internal cloud and and some outside. So the more and more applications go out, the more and more requirements come back to integrate with your internal data databases. So how that that the data in transit and data in store. Um, uh, storage where where they store at multiple uh, integration points. How secure are they? Right, that's another risk. Uh, so make sure that data at rest is secure, data in transit is secure. Whereas it's two ways are mutually authenticated between the two any two entities uh, in the, in the transit, and the data is all protected through some kind of uh, you know secure tunnels um, and different unique unique encryption keys are used for different consumer customers let's say if salesforce.com is hosting an application it has like 100 um, 100 customer hosting 100 application sorry 100 customers data are they all protected by the same key well it's protect, it's it's all encrypted but it's the same key or it's unique keys for per customer and who has access to those keys needs to be made sure the next one is multi-tenancy and physical security. So um, <coughs> the physical centers of data centers is obviously uh, important. Um, so if, if there is a, a theft at a data center, right, and it has multiple customers, uh, data is, is on that disk, on, on those hosts or resources, whatever it is. So it impacts multiple customers in a multi-tenant model. In a single tenant model, if some, you know, where each got their own physical um, or, or at least logical uh, controls around uh, customer data, you know, th the risk is less. But in multi-tenant model, where there are web, web, web servers or web tiers are shared, app tiers are shared, database tiers are shared, and they do reach back to their respective enterprises, right? So how, how tight are those controls? Um, can one application VM or JVM can open a socket connection to another J uh, JVM? Because they're all running on the same physical host. How? How? What are the policies? What are the Java policies, for example? How? How? How, can, how tight those those connections across these processes with running in the same VM are, are managed? Um, yeah. So the commingled um, tenant data and uh, malicious or ignorant tenant uh, or tenants are, are the basically the, um, the risks in this model. Um, this is just an incident. Um, I, I'm not going to go deep, but but about the WordPress, especially, right? An uncoordinated change in a database um, in 2000, last year impacted hundreds of tenants, including CNN. So there was no change in management in uh, in place. So they thought that it's a very simple change. They did not notify the tenants that there's a there's a downtime or there is some change management happening. Um, they made a change and, and that impacted hundreds of you. Many, how many times there's a small ACL change done by network admin impacts uh, hundreds of applications within, a, within one data center, within one enterprise. So um, the, the point here is if, if the change is related to one tenant, right, 
it needs to be architected in such a way that it impacts only that tenant. So make sure the security controls are architected uh, for multi-tenancy so that one, um, one change cannot impact the other one. Uh, controlled and coordinated change management, you know, letting the customers know that something is being impacted for, on your data center, uh, you know, on, on your VPDC, virtual private data center. Um, and, and regular third party assessments are done to make sure that uh, the multi tenancy is secure um, for, for you to adopt, for the cloud consumers to adopt. The same uh, architecture diagram is basically um, in t um, repeated here to show the complex, the more the complex architecture it is, the more security issues that, that come in, right? So complexity is the enmity of, of security. Uh, so if that, when the data is traversing across these multiple um, uh, integration points, and if there's an incident somewhere, I don't know how many of you worked in the incident management or P1 support, which I used to work before. Uh, when there is an incident of, of, of an outage of an application, so you need people from different infrastructure teams, business or IT, to, uh, to uh, contain that incident and, and you know um, fix it. So now you are dealing with multiple companies. So SaaS uh, provider using a PaaS provider, using an IS provider, and a cloud consumer, all on same one bridge to contain an incident and, and re resolve an incident, where it is happening, why it's happening, and so on and so forth. And uh, the, the reason why we clubbed at forensic support also within the same risk yeah. is if there is an incident and if there is a criminal uh, crime uh, related to uh, uh, incident and an FBI needs to investigate and they say okay freeze that disk now freeze that disk I need to uh, do the analysis okay now you have an incident related to one con customer or one con cloud consumer but the due to the multi tenancy you have data related to multiple cloud consumers on that so what does that mean to the rest of the uh, rest of the customers I mean, if you freeze the disk can their application run or their data is accessible is it something else uh, so as I said, uh, detailed forensic VM images to make sure um, that when such an uh, incident happens, you know, whether it's FBI it says freeze the disk, can the there needs to be some model for the application to continue to run, you know, maybe uh, duplicate um, disks or du duplicate application tiers or duplicate data centers uh, to con for the, again, goes back to risk for the, for the business continuing resiliency. And comprehensive logging to make sure that you have enough, the cloud provider has enough data to analyze when there is an incident, but at the same time, uh, it should not compromise performance of the application. So there, there needs to come up with a, um, uh, some kind of a comparable model to, to balance up those two. So there's, um, the next one is infrastructure security. The, the important point here is doesn't apply just for IS providers. You know, SaaS providers, SaaS providers, they all have infrastructures to uh, where their platforms or applications are running. And if there's a SaaS provider like Salesforce.com, how secure is their infrastructure? With the network, the storage, their, the host, um, whether the ports are open, uh, unnecessary ports are open, or is that the default configuration passwords are, are you know, properly changed or managed to make sure that uh, they, are, they don't fall to, uh, prey to the malicious parties who are actually scanning the internet for, for such, such, such applications or services. Um, so again, the third party audits, the, again, as I said, right, the, some of these mitigations could resolve multiple risk or help uh, in improving uh, multiple risk. The third party audits and app assess, vulnerability assessments of those of those providers, like let's say this infrastructure is certified by this particular uh, cloud auditor, um, uh, and make sure that those up uh, get inf enough information provided. What control they have to harden the network, harden the infrastructure, and do they have segregation of duties? And again, this applies for the SOX compliance and other compliance uh, tiered architecture with appropriate security controls in between, so that. Even if it's a difference in depth, even if there is a web server which is compromised, make sure that the the next level, which is app server tier, is not compromised. Even, even if it, they could get to that level, make sure that your database is really secure. So the uh, the the last one is risk exposure of non-production environment. So in general, the the mindset is an application which is not yet ready for production may have some bugs in it. So it could be application bugs, security bugs. 
Now, if if you are adopt if you adopted a IS provider, infrastructure pro, as a provider, fast provider, and you are developing an application and deploying there, it's not yet ready, but it's on the cl public cloud. So the, the all the bug fixes are not yet uh, fixed or identified, uh, even if they're security or non-security issues. But they, it's all on the public cloud, and and when they're testing, if the data is their testing is with the production data, so obviously <coughs> that will give a lot of exposure to unnecessary um, uh, uh, exposure to your production data through your non-production environment. Um, again, uh, the, the risk mitigations are use multiple layers of authentication. We are using VPC model for non-production environments, uh, virtual private cloud. So it's in the public cloud, but still it, it has the VPN gateways um, as a proxies for the, and you, the developers need to use v, virtual private cloud client, sorry, what VPC client to even get to the non-production for, for development of their applications. And don't use cloud for highly sensitive application. You know, that's, um, uh, you know, that's the safest one, if, if possible. Um, and make sure that uh, production data is masked um, uh, before it is copied to the non-production database for testing. So the summary is manage your uh, cloud risks to uh, sleep like a baby. So. So, so that you don't keep uh, they don't keep awake here at night. Okay, thank you.